Today, I'm gonna to show you how to build a REST API using Node, Express, TypeScript, and MongoDB. Let's get into it. I'm a programmer that's recently moved in with his girlfriend. Shocker, I know. And because we're splitting bills, I thought it would be fun to build a personal finance tool that we can use to manage our expenses. Now I've already built the front-end application part of the project. So the next step in the process is to build the API. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to show you guys my build process when I'm building a REST API. I've already planned out the data that I want these API endpoints to receive and to return, which is an essential step when you're developing a project like this, because you want to make sure that the code that you're actually writing is going to be fulfilling your requirements. To get started, we're going to open up an empty directory and run npm init. We can just press yes on all of these options here. And now let's just open it in VS Code. So first we're going to install a few packages. We're going to install Express, TSNode, and .env. We're also going to install some dev dependencies, which are going to be TypeScript, Nodemon, the Express types, and the Node types. Now to finish setting up TypeScript, we need to add in a tsconfig.json file to the root of our directory. Here's one that I've already got that suits the needs of this project, so we don't need to go and explain every single part of it. Also, because we're using Nodemon, we need to set up our nodemon.json file. Nodemon, by the way, is a really useful tool that automatically restarts your server when you make a change in your code. So you can develop so much faster. And finally, in my package.json file, I'm going to set the type to module and add in some scripts. These scripts can be used to start the server with Nodemon, also without Nodemon, and build the project into a distribution directory. If you're not familiar with Express, this is how you can create a basic web server in just a few lines of code. Inside of the start function, I'm loading my environment variables and then I'm creating a simple get request and then listening on port 5001 for any incoming requests. So if we were to run this now and then go to localhost 5001, we can see that we get the hello world response. Well done, you've just created a basic web server. Now, realistically, we could write all of our functionalities into this single index.ts file, but that could get really overwhelming and really unorganized pretty quickly. So we're going to add some structure to our project. The lib folder is going to contain all of the reusable functions that we need throughout the project. The middleware folder is going to contain any middleware functions that will be used to protect and secure our endpoints. The models folder is going to contain the database models and the roots folder is going to contain the functionalities for each of the endpoints. If the project was a little bit larger, I'd also recommend splitting up the roots and the controllers for the API endpoints, but because this isn't too big of a project, I'm not going to do that. Now, before we can start building any of the individual endpoints, we do need to define what our database models are going to look like, which is an essential step anyway, but it's even more essential when we're working with a database like MongoDB, which is a schemaless document database. For this project, we only need two data database models, transaction and user. I'm going to be using the mongoose ORM to interact with the MongoDB database, and you can install it using this command here. To create a new model, I'm going to create a new file called transaction.ts. Next, I can create an interface to define what the data looks like. So for the transaction model, I'm going to need the description. I'm going to need the total, which is the amount spent on the transaction. I'm going to need the date of the transaction, the user ID of the person who paid, the name of the business and an array of objects which contain information on the items in the sale. You can see that I'm storing the prices and the totals as whole numbers of pennies. This is because computers don't really like decimal places and can make mistakes when they are calculating them. So it's just a safer option. Now that we've got the transaction interface for TypeScript, we can use this to define the schema in Mongoose. Inside of the schema object, I'm going to copy across the interface, but using Mongoose's parameters to define the required items, data types, and references in the case of the user. Now, once that's done, we can export the Mongoose model with the name transaction. This model can now be imported into any of my TypeScript files and we can use it to interact with the transactions collection in the MongoDB database. To speed things up a bit, I've gone ahead and created the user model already. One of the really cool things about Mongoose is that you can add these additional functions to your models. So if you had a user object in your code, you could call the user.setPassword function to automatically encrypt the user's password and then store it in the database. With these two models created, we can now connect to the database inside of our index.ts file. To keep things organized, I like to create a separate file for the database connection because I don't want to have too much code inside of the index.ts file. You can see here that I'm getting the MongoDB connection string from my environment variables. So do not forget to put that there, otherwise your database won't connect. Now for this video, we're going to be building two endpoints. We're going to be building the create transaction endpoint, which is going to be a post request and allow us to submit data for the transactions into the database. 
And then I'm going to create the get transaction endpoint, which is going to be a get request and allow us to query the data and return it to our end client. I'm going to create a new TypeScript file for the transactions endpoints. Inside of this file, we're going to initialize the router object from Express and then import it so that it can be added to our index.ts file. Using app.use, we can define the path for the transactions endpoints and then import the transactions router. So now any endpoints that we write into the transactions.ts file will automatically be imported under the transactions path. I'm also quickly going to use the bodypass package to enable our API to receive JSON data because we're going to be sending JSON data to the endpoint. So if you don't add that, it won't work. To create the post request, we can use router.post and then we're going to set our path. In this case, I'm going to leave it empty so that the endpoint for our API is just going to be post transactions. Next, I'm going to add in the request and the response parameters. The request object can be used to access incoming information from the request and the response object can be used to set information for the response that is returned by the endpoint. The cool thing about TypeScript is that we can customize what these objects look like in order to suit our needs. In this case, our endpoint is going to be receiving some data to create a transaction record. So we can customize what the request body is going to look like by adding in the data points that we're sending to the API endpoint. We can now access these values inside of our endpoint. Also, as you can see, I've added in this try catch, which is going to catch any errors and return a 500 error response if any part of my code fails. I'm returning the response using a custom HTTP response function that I've made to make returning responses much easier. Realistically, you don't have to do this, but I do. Now, because we know what the data looks like, it makes it much easier to develop the functionality for the endpoint. For the functionality of this endpoint, there are going to be four steps. Number one, validating the incoming data. Number two, inserting the transaction data into the database. Number three, updating the user's balance in the database. And number four, returning the user data as a response. Validation can be as simple or as complicated as you like. However, I would recommend to protect your application as much as possible. First, we're checking to see if any of the required items are missing. Next, we're making sure that the total is actually a number. And then I'm also checking to see if the items array is actually an array and contains all of the necessary data. There is one more thing that we need to do to validate this request, and that is to check that the user that's being assigned to the transaction actually exists in the database. To do that, we can import the user model and then query using the find by ID function. If the user document doesn't exist, we can return a 400 error. By the way, if you're confused at what any of these error codes mean, you can find a list on Wikipedia. The 400 error means bad request, so we're essentially telling the user that the information that they have submitted is not the right information. Once we've passed all of the validation, we can begin adding this data to our database. After importing the transaction model, we can create a new document called transaction doc. We can then pass each of the values into this object and use the save function to save the transaction in the database. We also need to update the user's balance. So I'm going to do that by adding the total to the balance in the user doc, and then we can also save that. Finally, we can return the transaction data using the HTTP response function that I've set up. So that's this endpoint completed. Let's give it a quick test to see if it's working. Okay, fantastic, it works. We can now see the data that's stored inside of our MongoDB database here. Just to be clear, I had already added in a user object into my database for the purpose of this video. If you haven't got a user in the database already, the request most likely would have failed because the user can't be found in the database. With that working, I'm now going to briefly explain how I can build the get transactions endpoint. So this time we're creating a get request, but we're using the same path as we did to create transactions. So when we're sending data to our API, we can either send a get request to retrieve data or we can send a post request to submit data. Adding in the defined query parameters is pretty similar to defining the body interface that we created previously. So this endpoint is going to allow us to query the transactions by the user, the date range, and the total price of the transaction. We've also got a page number in there as well so that we are only returning the data that is needed to load a page on the front end application instead of returning all of the transactions in a single request because that would make for a bad experience. You'll notice that all of these values can also be null so we don't need to query by each of these values if we don't want to, apart from the page number which will automatically be set to one if it is not defined. To use these query values for our database query, we're going to need to design a MongoDB query object. Let's create a new query object and then we're going to create an interface to structure the query. Notice how once again, these values are not required because we don't want to include them if the query parameter has not been included in the request. By the way, the LTE and the GTE values that you're seeing here stand for less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. So assuming that we were trying to get transactions with a total value of between 200 and 100, the total object here would be less than or equal to 20 and greater than or equal to 100. 
So now if each of these parameters exist, we can add them to the query and then pass the query into the transaction.find function. I'm also going to sort these results by date with the most recent being first. I'm also going to add limit and skip to the query, which is only going to return a maximum of 10 transactions and it's going to skip to the right amount to essentially implement a pages functionality. We can now return these transactions and give the endpoint a test. You can see here that I'm sending a get request instead of a post request. We can also change the query parameters. So let's say we want to find all transactions that are over 100 pounds, meaning that this value is in pennies. So therefore that needs to be 10,000. Perfect. This is working really well. We're almost done with the development of this API. There's just one more thing to do. We do need to talk about how we can protect our application from being attacked. So because we're dealing with potentially sensitive financial information, we need to make sure that our application is protected, but also that our users are protected. That's why I'm super grateful that ArcJet is sponsoring today's video. ArcJet makes it extremely easy to add multiple layers of security to your JavaScript based projects. And this is what we're going to be using to protect our project today. If you're interested, you can click the link on the screen now to learn more about ArcJet. We're going to be implementing multiple security rules, including bot detection, rate limiting, and shield, as well as also preventing VPNs and proxies from impersonating users and accessing records. Because the biggest threat to an application like this is automated attacks. I'm only going to cover a few protections in today's video because frankly, there are so many to cover. But if you want to learn more about the different features that ArcJet has, I'd recommend that you go to their website. Using the ArcJet documentation, we can install the ArcJet package from here, and then make sure to copy your project key and paste it into your environment file. Inside of our middleware folder, I'm going to create a new file called arcjet.ts. And then I'm going to paste this arcjet configuration and make sure that all of the packages are imported. Now I'm going to create a new function, which is going to be called AJ middleware. We're going to use this to protect our roots. So we can now add this to our roots and it will execute the code in this middleware function before executing the code in the endpoint. So inside of this function, we can use arcjet to filter out any potential threats. Let's just copy the code from the example for now, and then we'll add some more. The default configuration has three rules, which essentially are layers of security that each request must pass. Here we have shield, bot detection, and a token bucket, which is what allows us to implement rate limiting. If we test this by sending a few requests, we can see that eventually it blocks us from sending any more because we've hit the rate limit. Now I'm going to add in some more protection to show you what else it can do. I'm going to add another check, which is going to see if a VPN or proxy is being used to access the API and then block it. If the IP is from a proxy or a VPN, we're going to return a 403 error. There are a few additional minor things that you can do to protect your project, such as using the body parser package to limit the size of requests. And you can also use the course package to protect your API from being used by hosts that aren't your website. So essentially no one can impersonate your website. So now what's next? Well, if you run npm build, you can build the project and then manually deploy it to your server. Or you can use tools like GitHub Actions to automatically deploy it for you. I've got another tutorial on GitHub Actions. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can click the link on the screen now. I'm going to publish all of this code to GitHub. So if you want to give it a clone and check it out for yourself, you can do. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and I really hope you learned something. If you did, please do leave a like down below, hit the subscribe button if you're new and tap the bell icon to get notified every time I post a new video. See ya.